Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, and I really thank the Iowa Humane Society for making it possible. I feel in some ways like a fox in the chicken coop because I have had a few problems occasionally with what some of the land-grant colleges <coughs> have been doing to the environment in terms of short-term profit. We are on the threshold now with our newfound power over the genes of life to remake the entire creation in our own image, to convert the natural world into an efficient, industrialized biosphere. Is that the kind of world we want? This new biotechnology could be used to truly begin to heal the earth and humanity in the process. It needs to be applied with the right attitude, the right reverence. Outside of this memorial building is a beautiful fountain. <laughs> you should go and see it again. And it's the corn goddess in her four aspects because of the four directions. And the goddess is there planting the corn and then nurturing it and then gathering it and then nursing a child, a Christ child if you wish. Because this whole cycle of life is a sacred circle. It's a unified field. There are no outside standards. If you feel that you're outside, you're beginning to objectify the world, to establish a duality, and that's a pathology of today. Corn is no longer seen as sacred. It's seen primarily as a commodity. Corn is a commodity, but it is also sacred. It comes out of the sacred hoop or the sacred circle. We've used corn, corn for many purposes, plowing up vast acres, primarily to feed farm animals. And as a consequence, we destroy the prairie, we displace wildlife, we reduce biological diversity with these monocultures of corn and pigs and cattle and people. It's not the way to farm sustainably. It's not sustainable. That's why many farmers are going out of business right now. We need a new paradigm. And I do believe that this genetic engineering biotechnology can be applied well in the right process. I have many quotes here that I'd like to share with you before I give you a tape cassette slideshow. The slideshow deals with various perceptions of animals and nature from the original scriptures of not only the first people, but also of our long-term Judeo-Christian, Muslim or Islamic, Buddhist and Hindu traditions. But a few quotes here from scientists and philosophers to try to set the stage as a dialogue between science and progress and scientism, scientific imperialism and the rising technocracy of today. The rising technocracy that sees nothing ethically or morally wrong in patenting animals, in giving them the official stamp of approval of a new attitude that they are simply commodities and inventions. The whole of life now can be patented outside of Washington, D.C. This country has gone on record now for all time as endorsing that attitude. We're completely commoditizing the Earth's processes and all who dwell therein, including humanity, when you look at human rights being violated, both here and abroad. Yesterday I was in San Francisco <coughs> and was with uh, um, a native person from the Amazon. And his people are being shot right now, kicked off their land, by miners and those cutting the tropical rainforests to raise beef, primarily for export to this country and to Japan. That is not progress, that is ecocide. So what I'm saying is that our rising technocracy is using science in a very imperialistic way. We have great instrumental knowledge. This application suffers from ontological reductionism. We lose part of the sense and the feeling for the whole. We must return to a kind of an, an empathetic knowledge rather than an instrumental knowledge. And Barbara McClintock, who got the Nobel Prize for her research on corn genetics, said that you must have a feeling for the organism. When you have this feeling, this indwellingness with it, then you begin to really know. You have a deep empathetic understanding. And this is what we need now to bring us around. Think of this quote from University, Harvard University biologist E. O. Wilson in his book on human nature. He says, the time has come to ask 
does a way exist to divert the power of religion into the service of the great new enterprise that lays bare the sources of that power. Make no mistake about the power of scientific materialism. It presents the human mind with an alternative mythology that until now has always point for point in zones of conflict defeated traditional religion. This is the voice of the technocracy rising today. It is the religion of materialism, of dualism. It is illusory, it is destructive. It is driven by fear, fear of life and death and need for power, control, predictability. It's driven by greed, which is a form of fear because it's based on insecurity. And it's based upon a lack of deep love for the whole, reverence for living things. We tried to, a couple of years ago now, stop the National Institutes of Health for, from creating transgenic animals, putting human genes into pigs and so on, arguing that a pig has an inherent nature or a telos, a pig mess. The scientists denied that animals have an inherent nature. There's also a general view that animals do not have feelings, they do not have souls and so on, and there's nothing sacred in nature. What we've done is dis discarded the creation so that we can rape it. And Wilson is endorsing this view. It ties in too, of course, with patriarchy, since it has been given religious sanction for many years, especially by the Church of Rome. Carolyn Merchant, ecologist, scientist, feminist, in her book, The Death of Nature, says, in investigating the roots of our current environmental dilemma and its connection to science, technology, and the economy, we must re-examine the formation of a worldview and a science that, by reconceptualizing reality as a machine rather than a living organism, sanctioned the domination of both nature and women. Another woman, the late Indira Gandhi, Prime Minister of India, Everything is interdependent, man, animal, and environment, whatever the economical or political context. Everything is related. Whatever happens now to animals will eventually happen to man. The conservation of our inheritance deserves the same natural care as our economical development. Now, biotechnology could be one of the greatest threats to bio biodiversity worldwide if we start introducing new genetically engineered life forms, primarily for agricultural industrial purposes introducing cattle, for example, resistant to sleeping sickness into wilderness areas of Africa will mean the extinction, the final extinction of many wild species, of plants and animals. Is that the way to go? Certainly it's not prudent to endeavor to feed a population of six billion on meat, whether it's genetically engineered or not. So we need to rethink our agricultural paradigm. We need to rethink our medical paradigm too in which an awful lot of animal suffering occurs needlessly in laboratories. Vivisectors are not cruel, they're caught in a cruel conceptual bind, which again is dualistic and not holistic. The holistic or gestalt perception realizes the wisdom of preventive, holistic and environmental medicine and doesn't move in simply to profit by treating the symptoms. The first patent was awarded on, to Harvard University for a genetically engineered mouse that is very susceptible to cancer. It has a human oncogene that makes it very susceptible to carcinogenic chemicals. Ironically, the patent is owned by DuPont Chemical, one of the biggest world manufacturers and distributors of pesticides. The point that I'm getting to here is that they're going to use this mouse to screen for dangerous chemicals and you also use it to, to find cures for women with breast cancer. It's nonsense. It gives the public a false feeling of security wellness a better med medical model, this is medical progress. Medical progress is to stop you all from getting breast cancer. And what is the statistic now? One woman in three is going to get it in this room. Uh, but there we get into the politics of medicine. Because of agrochemical poisons, uncontrolled industrial pollutants and so on, uh, these other industries will not give way. And so the medical industry finishes up profiting from the tragic fallout. So again, we need to change, to change our agricultural practices, to make our land healthy, we'll make our children healthy. And the writing is very clearly on the wall. So we need an ethical sensibility now for science toward a more empathetic knowledge. The founder of the Baha'i faith, 
Abdul Baha said, it is not possible to fly with one wing alone. Should a man try to fly with the wing of religion alone, he will quickly fall into a quagmire of superstition. Whilst on the other hand, with the wing of science alone, he would also make no progress, but fall into the despairing slough of materialism. When a religion shorn of its superstitions, traditions, and unintelligent dogmas shows its conformity with science in the world, then there will be a great unifying, a cleansing force, which will sweep before it all wars, disagreements, discords, and struggles. And then will humankind be united in the power and the love of God. Another quote now from some scientists who have feeling for the whole. Richard Levins and Richard Lewontin in The Dialectical Biologist, published by Harvard University Press 85. The commoditization of science stands between the powerful insights of science and corresponding advances in human welfare, often producing results that contradict the stated purposes. The continuation of hunger in the modern world is not the result of an intractable problem thwarting our best efforts to feed people, Rather, agriculture in the capitalist world is directly concerned with profit and only indirectly concerned with feeding people. Similarly, the organization of healthcare is directly an economic enterprise and only secondarily influenced by people's health needs. Thing of health needs, I introduced Shiza Chavez at a conference yesterday in San Francisco. And the great boycott, by the way, is still on. They are soaked in pesticides. There's no protection from the migrant workers. And their children are like the modern canaries of today. They're having serious health problems and birth defects. Oh, a friend of mine in India wrote this. His name is Naganathan. He's a physicist. Science is an intellectual activity ethically neutral. It is bereft of any self-correcting governor. The evils of science cannot be cured by science itself. Those who pin their hopes on scientific advances, however brilliant, do a disservice in that they blind us to the really crying need for a revolution in human ethics and pave the way for ever-increasing adventurism attended by greater and yet greater disasters. I'll give you a quote from another scientist now. I'll give you his name afterwards. I'll give it first, otherwise you won't listen. You'll be wondering who it is. It's Albert Einstein. A human being is a part of the whole, called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. His exper he experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This is this dualism again. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Nobody is able to achieve this completely, but the striving for such achievement is in itself a part of the liberation and a foundation for inner security. Very recently, His Holiness Pope John Paul II, whom I questioned about three years ago when he said in an address that it is certain that animals are intended for man's use, I asked His Holiness for the basic biblical or papal uh, verification of this conclusion and received none, he has now come out with an encyclical of general social concerns. And in this concern, he exhorts us all to have deep respect for every living entity, animals, plants, and even non-living things, and to not let our economic needs take precedence over concern for these entities. Now, this is an extraordinary statement from a religious tradition that has been extremely patriarchal and dominionistic. We are beginning to see a change now in mainstream religion 
and part of it has been brought on by the environmental crisis, which is environmental awareness, to a creation-centered spirituality. And this is very potent. We had a conference last weekend in Washington with 24 leading representatives of the major Christian denominations. And they came out with two declarations. One was an agreed-upon consensus that there should be a moratorium on the patenting of animals, pending further discussion ethically, socially, economically. They gave a general statement, which I'll give you before giving a slideshow, which I find again encouraging that the worldview is changing, that science and ethics is coming together, that the spiritual and the material is beginning to resonate again. This consultation was on respect for life and environment, moral and theological aspects of genetic engineering and biotechnology. And the statement reads as follows. We affirm that humanity and all of nature live in a relationship of mutuality and interaction in covenant with the Creator. We recognize that the human species is not in right relationship with the rest of creation and that our transgression lies in our continued abuse of the creation and our desire to remake it in our own image as a means of satisfying exclusively human ends. Redemption includes not only personal salvation, but also the restoration of the natural world and establishment of a relationship that will protect the integrity of creation. The ethical, environmental, socioeconomic, and theological ramifications of genetic engineering and patenting of life are profound. They point to the probability that the integrity and future of creation will be placed in even greater jeopardy if our power over the genes of life is not exercised prudently and with reverence to help restore the covenant, to heal the earth and ourselves. It's very telling that they include in redemption not only personal salvation, but the restoration of the planet. A lot of this will take a new sensitivity and openness We've been denying the holocaust of the animal kingdom, the extinction of wildlife, the destruction of tropical rainforests for too long. We have to begin to feel this, then we will be moved. As one Christian mystic says, we, in our awakening, we bear the stigmata of an earth crucified. But in less theological terms, I'll give you some simple words of an Australian Aboriginal, the kind of sensitivity that we need for our survival now. A new technological fix is not going to work. We need a cognitive fix through the awakening of feeling. This is Bill Neji. He's a Kakadu man. Remember, the Australian Aboriginals have been in Australia for 40,000 years, and the place is beautiful. We've been here less than 200 years. If you feel sore, headache, sore body, that means somebody killing tree or grass. You feel because your body in that tree or earth. Nobody can tell you. You've got to feel it yourself. So now I want to give you a slide presentation. We will look at we will look at animals, nature, and religion, and see how perceptions are changing. This slideshow lasts for about thirty minutes. Okay, I, I, I think they can all go out so everybody can sleep if they wish. No, I can't see a darn thing. Play.
the world's major religions had much to teach us about our proper place in nature and how we ought to treat our fellow animals and relate to the rest of creation. According to the Hopi Indians, we are out of balance with the rest of creation, a condition which they term Koyanaskatsi, which means life out of balance. The ancient spiritual philosophy of Taoism emphasized that the way to world peace and harmony is for humanity to live in balance with nature, which they depicted symbolically as the creative embrace of heaven and earth, or yin and yang. This unity and complementarity of opposites is symbolically depicted as Father Sky, or the Great Spirit, and Mother Earth by the Navajo Indians, whom they regard as our original parents. Native peoples also find spiritual symbolism in various creatures, the spider, for example, being sacred to many American Indians because it represents the seamless web of life or the unified field of existence in which everything is interconnected and interdependent. The modern science of ecology confirms this intuitive wisdom that all of life is interconnected and interdependent. This means that no species is more or less superior or inferior to any other. As one theologian has said, ecology is the science of the body of Christ through which we of the earth community learn our sacred connectedness. In a spiritual sense, therefore, ecology reveals to us the sacred unity of all life. Molecular biology also teaches us about this unity and interdependence. The elements that make up our own bodies, such as carbon, phosphates, and nitrogen, circulate through the food chain and through the soil, the water, and even the air that we breathe. The old Zen aphorism that rocks are peopling rocks is true insofar as the minerals from the rocks leach into the soil and are incorporated into plant life that we in turn eat and incorporate into our own bodies. In other words, the earth is our flesh and we should treat it with the same respect as we would treat our own bodies. Evolutionary biology also teaches us about the biological interconnectedness of various species. Even the structure of human DNA, which could be regarded as God's blueprint, is basically similar for human beings as it is for other animals and even for plants. Physiologically and anatomically, the human species is also essentially the same as any other vertebrate species. Charles Darwin, in his theory of evolution, insisted that human beings were not superior. Indeed, he used to write down on his hand every day, not superior, because he envisioned evolution like a tree, with the various species occupying different branches. He did not envision a hierarchical ladder with Homo sapiens at the top. In Ecclesiastes, it is stated that the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and a man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and all turn to dust again. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of beast goes down to earth? In other words, it is vain for us to think that we are some kind of special creation, but this view is still widely held. The science of ethology, the study of animal behavior, reveals that humans and non-human animals share similar emotional states and often express their emotions in similar ways, like the greeting grin of the human and dog or wolf, which are virtually identical and express friendly intentions and the emotional feeling of pleasure and happiness. It is through the sharing of such affection with other animals that we enjoy communion with them. Ethology also teaches us that human beings are not the only animals who show empathy, altruism, and compassion. One dog, for example, will take care of a sick or injured companion, licking the other's sores and even providing it with food until it has recovered. The altruistic behavior of dogs rescuing other injured animals and even people has been eulogized by poets, artists, and others. We should not simply dismiss such behavior as irrational and unconsciously instinctive, but rather recognize that such altruistic behavior is not a uniquely human trait. It is a quality that we share with other animals. It is a tragic irony 
that in the face of scientific evidence to the contrary, we should treat such animals so cruelly as in biomedical research, where animals are all too often subjected to unnecessary, unconscionable suffering, even being shocked, mutilated, poisoned, and extensively burned in the name of medical progress for the benefit of human beings. Surely, no good ends can come from evil means. It is also a tragedy of the times that there are people who seem to enjoy seeing animals suffer, like those who own, train, and enjoy the spectacle of pit bull terriers tearing each other apart. This is certainly one of the most cruel and demeaning spectator sports in this modern age. Abraham Lincoln once said, I care not for a man's religion whose dog and cat are not the better for it. Animal cruelty of this kind reflects such a profound lack of empathy and emotional connectedness toward animals that it is surely a disease in itself. Much like the vivisection of animals in the name of scientific curiosity and knowledge for knowledge's sake. There is a widely held view that nature and animals have been created for man's own exclusive use and that animals do not have interests, inherent value, feelings or rights. Thus, it is not considered unethical to sacrifice them in the name of science. But to sacrifice them for magical and occult purposes, like making a power circle out of various decapitated animals with their heads impaled on stakes, is not acceptable today, even though ritual animal sacrifice was a religious practice having wide acceptance in the past. The erroneous notion that animals are unfeeling machines is called Cartesianism, which is the philosophy of René Descartes, who once said that the screams of animals being vivisected were simply the sounds of their body machines breaking down. Descartes argued that animals do not have souls because they lack the power of reason, and since they lack souls, they cannot suffer. Yet it is clearly stated in the Old Testament that animals are of the same breath of creation or origin as we, and all have or are living souls called nefesh in Hebrew. Thanks to the mechanistic and materialistic worldviews of Descartes, Newton, and Francis Bacon, the stage was set by the 17th century for the unsoulment of animals and the desacralization of nature, which became an industrialized resource. Such views contaminated religious attitudes toward nature and animals, which now need to be changed in the light of new scientific evidence of the unity, ecological interdependence, and biological kinship of all life. Without any apparent ethical sensibility, scientists have recently created, through embryonic manipulation, creatures called geeps, monstrous chimeras with the head of a goat and the body of sheep. Through genetic engineering biotechnology, which may well alter the entire course of creation, animals like the dairy cow will in the future be made into biological machines to ever more efficiently serve the needs of man who plays God. Where indeed is the respect for the sanctity of life when animal beings are mutilated and deformed for human enjoyment, like the circus unicorn of Barnum and Bailey, which is nothing more than a goat with a transplanted horn in the center of its head. And what kind of love is it, except perhaps a perverse sentimentality for the deformed and helpless that makes people keep and breed genetically defective purebred dogs, like the bulldog with such a deformed face that it has great difficulty breathing. Certainly, such creatures are to be loved, but it is surely unloving to deliberately propagate them so that there will be ever more generations of offspring who will suffer. If the human species has truly been made in the image of God, then should we not treat all living things as we would have God treat us? And that is with humility, respect, and compassion in our relations with each other, with nature, and with the animals. But instead, we choose to assume the authority of God in claiming dominion over God's creation. The image of St. George slaying the dragon, the serpent dragon as a sacred symbol of many pagan cultures, since it represents the forces of nature, gives religious sanction to man's domination of nature, 
which is regarded in an adversarial way as being evil, if not fallen. The ritual enactment of our domination over nature is exemplified by the rodeo, where animals are cruelly treated, roped, and restrained, a public exhibition which, like the animal circus, indoctrinates children with the belief that it is not wrong to treat animals in such ways. It is a feeling of superiority and a lack of true humility and compassion that lead us to regard others as somehow inferior. As animal rights are violated today, so human rights have been long violated as by the white colonists who engaged in human slavery. That we have dominion over the rest of creation according to the book of Genesis does not mean that we have free license to exploit others for our own selfish ends. The original meaning of the word dominion, which is derived from the Latin domino to rule over, comes from the Hebrew word vayerdu. According to Rabbi Harold White, this word can be traced to the root verb yorad. Yorad means literally to go down, to place oneself in sympathy with the animal kingdom and to recognize our commonality with the animals. When dominion is motivated by love, we have the ecumenical politics of what amounts to a trans-species democracy. But when it is motivated simply by self-serving power, it amounts to nothing more than biological fascism. The human-centered, so-called anthropocentric view that Homo sapiens is a special and therefore superior creation, ironically linked with an anthropomorphic, human-like conception of divinity, has two pernicious consequences. The first is to set up a false duality between humans and other animals, between civilization and the environment, and between God and nature. The second is to create a linear hierarchical worldview with God being conceived as being transcendent only and not also co-inherent or imminent in nature. This essentially patriarchal view, which Aristotle, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, and Calvin, among others, endorsed, stands in sharp contrast to a more holistic, egalitarian view where divinity, nature, humans, and animals are all one. This latter, so-called panentheistic view, places ethical constraints upon how we treat the rest of creation because God is not simply transcendent. God is also in all, and all is in God. St. Francis, in his teachings, emphasized that the animals and all of nature are part of God's creation, that they are in God and through or by way of them, God's creative love can be realized and revered. It is certain that when we had no civilization nor worldview that separated us from nature, because we were part of nature as gatherer hunters, we felt in the very core of our being our connectedness with the whole of creation. Nature, the earth, was seen as the all-providing mother, and the female qualities of fecundity and nurturance, as expressed in the Venus miniature carvings of Bronze Age cave dwellers, were revered. The earth, as mother goddess, as exemplified by the statue of Diana of Ephesus, was linked with a pre-Christian pagan reverence for nature and by such seasonal rituals as the harvest festival and the springtime dressing of the wells in England, which were later assimilated into Christianity. There was no question that animals and nature were sacred, had spirits or souls, and were part of the same origin or creation as we. The belief that animals had one or more guardian spirits was common to European cultures, like the symbol of Pan, protector of herds and flocks and wild creatures, which was part of the pantheon of Greco-Roman civilization before the rise of Christianity. We should also remember the animal-headed divinities of the last great civilization before ours, the Egyptian pantheon with its animal-headed divinities such as Isis, Anubis, and Horus should not be misinterpreted as pagan animism that makes animals into gods. Rather, Animals were perceived as manifestations of various aspects of divinity and were revered for these qualities, such as Bastet the cat, who exemplified qualities of grace, sagacity, and fecundity. Likewise, to be concerned today about the non-human creation from a spiritual perspective and to 
we incorporate animals into the scope of moral and religious principles is not a regression to ancient polytheism and animism. In the Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita, we find the declaration, we bow to all beings with great reverence in the thought that God enters into them through fractioning himself as living creatures. This is not pagan animal worship. As Albert Schweitzer said, to the truly ethical man, all of life is sacred, including forms of life that from the human point of view may seem lower than ours. This is certainly not pagan idolatry. Yet, is it not a kind of idolatry to worship the image of oneself as God? The human-centered and male human image of divinity may well have its roots in the Greek pantheon where all divine and mortal beings, especially those that are female, are subordinate to the top god Zeus. It is likely from this cosmology today's patriarchal worldview of male superiority and domination finds its roots. The beautiful myth of Adam and Eve can be seen as a description of the evolution of human consciousness. Adam, after eating the apple from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, is no longer like any other animal. He is aware of his own nakedness, which means being aware of and terrified of his own mortality. He has a moral sensibility, knowing good from evil, and also possesses some godlike powers, such as creativity, instrumental knowledge, and the ability to objectify the world by giving names to things. It was Lauren Isley who wrote, the Eden of the present that the animal world had known for ages was shattered at last. Through the human mind, time and darkness, good and evil, would enter and possess the world. End of quote. Evil arises from human ignorance, arrogance, fear of life and death, and from the selfish use and abuse of our powers of dominion. In trying to become gods in and for ourselves, and thus separating ourselves from the created order and our place therein, we fail to recognize our own limitations and dependence upon the whole. Father Sean McDonough offers a cosmic view of sin, stating, if sin destroys the harmony between human beings and the natural world, then redemption, to be complete, must heal and renew the primordial unity and recreate the earth wherever it has been injured through human greed and vice. The teachings of all the world's major religions have long recognized the virtues of humility and compassionate benevolence toward all fellow beings as enlightened self-interest. Recent studies have shown that there is a direct link between cruelty toward animals in childhood and later violent and criminal behavior in adulthood. Compassion is a boundless ethic. It can never be arbitrary. Yet only too often, for reasons of custom, convenience, expedience, and profit, we fail to give other animals equal and fair consideration. Do we not demean ourselves in our indifference toward the suffering that we cause them, and in our uncritical acceptance of animal exploitation? While creatures like the lamb were revered as sacred symbols by the Judeo-Christian tradition, we have the cruel incarceration of such creatures as the veal calf. Raised for 16 weeks in narrow crates, they are deprived of their most basic freedoms, even to be able to comfortably and easily stand up, turn around, lie down, walk, stretch, and interact with each other. It is also a tragic irony that the horrendous public spectacle of a bullfight is a most popular spectator event, particularly in Roman Catholic countries. There is a discrepancy today between what the various religions teach and preach and how their followers relate to the rest of God's creation, and between what is taught in terms of our place in nature, our duties towards the creation, and what science now reveals to us about animals and nature. In India, where Hinduism is the major religion and the cow is especially revered in temples and shrines, there is much abuse of these animals in slaughterhouses and as beasts of burden. There are also serious problems associated with ritual slaughter that leaders of the Islamic and Judaic traditions are at last beginning to address. As it says in the book of Isaiah, he who kills an ox is like he who kills a person. And the Quran proclaims, 
There is not an animal on earth, nor a flying creature on two wings, that they are like unto you. And as the Bible proclaims that a merciful man will be merciful to his beast, so the holy prophet Muhammad said, whoever is kind to the creatures of God is kind to himself. In addition to regarding non-human animals as being morally worthy of consideration and making them part of our community of moral concern and social responsibility, they are also part of the same ecological community as we. We therefore harm them when we harm the environment. There is little reverence for the environment when nature is seen simply as a resource. We are turning the natural world into a polluted and industrialized wasteland. It is surely true that as the poet Marilyn Lesseur concluded, we can only destroy that which we objectify, end quote. And this happens when we treat nature and animals as resources and objects. Since the earth is our flesh, we harm ourselves and our children's children when we harm the earth. Industrial pollutants and agri-poisons, especially pesticides, contaminate our food and drinking water. And along with acid rain, are killing the life in freshwater lakes. Worldwide pollution is destroying the environment and the wildlife therein. Since everything is interconnected, our own health suffers as a consequence. Hence the epidemics of cancer, birth defects, genetic damage, and other complex health problems that we face today. And no amount of laboratory animal research and animal suffering and sacrifice is going to help prevent these problems. The covenant to dress and keep the Garden of Eden has been long broken. In spite of the implicit conservation message of the story of Noah, who saved the animals from the flood, the flood today is the holocaust of the animal kingdom. As witness, the many abuses of animals today, such as the wholesale decimation of whales simply for their oil and other raw materials, and the suffering and killing of wild animals in steel jaw leg hole traps for their fur, which no one in his or her right mind could wear. Wild animals are also poisoned and their habitats destroyed so that we may raise sheep and cattle and farm animal feeds to indulge our taste for meat. In addition to the cruel treatment of factory farmed animals, too often kept in overcrowded and stressful conditions, we should also consider the risks to our own health of the antibiotics and other drugs that are given to these animals to make them more productive and to help them cope with the stressful and disease-promoting conditions in which they are incarcerated. We should also reflect upon the fact that the more meat and other farm animal produce we consume, the more land is cleared and used to raise feed for farm animals. By so doing, we are contributing to the displacement and extermination of wildlife and of their habitats. There are alternatives to meat-based agriculture. For example, 360 pounds of soybean protein can be produced from one acre of land, while only 20 pounds of beef can be produced from one acre. One of the greatest threats to wildlife worldwide, other than human overpopulation, is the expanding cattle industry. The clearing of land, especially of tropical forests, to raise cattle for meat export to affluent countries and destruction of trees for firewood, combined with overpopulation, interact to contribute to drought, famine, and the collapse of traditional, sustainable agricultural practices. As the Bible instructs, as we sow, so shall we reap. In addition to modern chemically dependent agriculture, great harm is done to the environment by the timber industry. Vast hillsides of trees may seem natural, but these are simply industrial landscapes, since virtually nothing else can grow where these trees, all of one species, have been planted. In many parts of the world, the construction of dams for hydroelectric power in order to stimulate further industrial production and expansion has caused irreparable damage to nature. These trends can be reversed once it is realized that it is enlightened self-interest to do so. A sound and sustainable economy 
and a stable and healthy ecology go hand in hand. We can begin to repair the covenant by helping protect wildlife directly by not wearing their furs, and indirectly by reducing or stopping our consumption of meat and other consumptive habits wasteful of natural resources. And chemically addicted farmers can shift to low input organic or regenerative agriculture which will benefit all of life. We can encourage children not to make pets of wild animals and come to respect the sanctity and dignity of all creatures, realizing that those that are domesticated pets, in quotes, are ours only in sacred trust and should not be humanized or anthropomorphized or be treated as objects of property or as toys or status symbols. Indeed, our companion animals are perhaps closer to divinity than we in the unconditional love that they bestow upon us. Companion animals, like all creatures, have needs and interests and are worthy of equal and fair consideration. Humane education and animal rights philosophy have done much to encourage these values and a more egalitarian attitude toward animals. As Albert Schweitzer said, without a reverence for all life, and by that we must also include nature, we will never enjoy world peace. The animal rights revolution, which holds that all creatures should be given equal and fair consideration, is part of the